Hi, hello, it's me, a Julian Greystoke. Again, imagine that on my channel. Shocking. So as many of you know, if you were here on this channel, I recently finished reading the first book in The Wheel of Time, and as predicted, it has put me in a huge fantasy slump. I just don't want to read any more fantasy books right now. And usually when that happens, I go looking for thrillers, because they're so different from each other, fantasy and thrillers, that like it's a great palette cleanser for me. So I booted up my library's app and I looked for thrillers and I snatched one that was available now. And that was called The Book of Cold Cases. First, let's read our blurb, shall we? In 1977, Claire Lake, Oregon was shaken by the Lady Killer murders. Two men, seemingly randomly, were murdered with the same gun, with the strange notes left behind. Beth Greer was the perfect suspect, a rich, eccentric, 23-year-old woman seen fleeing one of the crimes. But she was acquitted, and she retreated to the isolation of her mansion. Oregon, 2017. Shay Collins is a receptionist, but by night she runs a true crime website. They all do. They all do. The Book of Cold Cases, a passion fueled by the attempted abduction she escaped as a child. When she meets Beth by chance, Shay asks for an interview. To Shay's surprise, Beth says yes. They meet regularly at Beth's mansion, though Shay is never comfortable there. Items move when she's not looking, and she could swear she's seen a girl outside the window. The allure of learning the truth about the case from the smart, charming Beth is too much to resist. But even as they grow closer, Shay senses something isn't right. Is she making friends with a manipulative murderer, or are there other dangers lurking in the darkness of Greer House? Um, it would be great if, you know, that last line, that last, like, enticing line about, like, what's going on, what's really going on, uh, it would be great if that was actually, like, left up to us to wonder for a lot longer than it was. We'll talk about that. This book was weird. It was really weird, and it left me with a lot of mixed feelings. And I don't know if I mean good weird. Like, it wasn't weird like, trippy or hard to understand, or, like, all that different from other thrillers that I've read. Technically, this is a supernatural thriller. I'm gonna get that out of the way right away because the book does pretty quickly as well. Honestly, I don't know how spoilery I'm gonna be, but I'm sure I will put it up on the title of this video so you'll know. So, when I first read the blurb, it was reminiscent to me of, like, Murder, Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. You've got the plucky young person, pseudo-journalist, because she runs a blog, who wants to interview this star, in this case, acquitted murder suspect, about her life and the crime and whatever. And, like, the cliches are piling up immediately because the main character is the victim of a past crime and now is really into true crime. And apparently that's just everybody. I don't know why. Like, every modern, really recent thriller that I've been picking up, unless it's by one of the, like, the really big name thriller writers, and even then sometimes, it the main character is always this archetype. Victim of a previous crime, and for some reason that makes them fascinated with finding out more about crimes. And either they're an author, a journalist, someone working in the medical field, whatever it is, a blogger about true crimes, whatever it is, that gets them close to crimes, they want to do that. I don't know how realistic that is. Like, if you were the victim of a crime as a young person, does that automatically make you want to be really into crimes as an adult? I feel like it might make you want to avoid that, because wouldn't it be kind of triggering? But in any case, in these books, these women are always that. Always those things. And this character is no exception. The particular thing that happened to her when she was young could have been much worse. Um, a lot of times these women escape from murderers and stuff like that. She was almost kidnapped. She managed to, like, she got into the car with the stranger, but she managed to throw herself out of the car and get away, and instead he went and captured and assaulted somebody else. Which would leave a lot of room, you would think, for some really great guilt on her part, but we really barely touch on that, which is kind of disappointing. I seem to be talking about characters now, so the other main character obviously is the woman who was accused of the lady killer murders from the 70s, and she's like this enigmatic loner who never talks to anyone and lives in her family's home even though it's where her father was brutally murdered in the kitchen. Which is something else we need to bring up, is like, why is she still living there? That's brought up in the book, they keep asking it, and then we kind of get an answer, but it wasn't very satisfactory if you ask me. Like, I could see like maybe what the author was going for, but I wish that we had doubled down on it. So this woman was like very famous for a while as the suspect of the 
the lady killer murders and she's a really interesting person to me and like I wish she was more fleshed out. She's not as well fleshed out as she could be but she is someone who is very asexual coded. She's super ace coded and unfortunately found herself in this situation where being like sexy and desirable gave her power and so she's living this like dichotomy of knowing that she looks sexy to people and using that because she's got to you got to pick an identity when when you're in the in the spotlight there's or they'll pick it for you you know and so she kind of just ended up with this one and she's so sexy she's so sexual in the way she dresses the way she moves the way she talks everyone has like put this label onto her in reality when you're like in her point of view she has no interest in any of it she has as best we can tell never had a single relationship so she's very ace coded and I found that interesting to explore the idea of someone who is not interested in sex but is labeled as like this femme fatale basically by the press and has to you and then is forced basically to use that to her advantage because there were other things that they could label her as that she likes less so she's a really interesting character and we didn't get enough of her in my opinion we got some flashbacks of her but like modern her I really wish we had gotten more of because she's way more interesting than the main character. The main character is just that bog standard thriller heroine that we have seen a million billion times. She wants to get the scoop for her blog. She's really plucky and excited and wants to solve the mystery. We do have the side angle of her having recently come off of a divorce and then a relationship that she's building with I think he's a PI. There's two, there's two guys that she interacts with a lot. One's a cop and I think one's a PI and like I kind of can't tell them apart. I struggled with the guys. But she has a romance eventually with the, the PI which was for a thriller refreshing because in thrillers the romance, the, the romantic male is almost always evil in some way. If he's not the killer, he's in some other way using her or going to hurt her or going to try to hurt her. So it was really refreshing to have not that in this book. He was just a romantic interest. Honestly, I'll take anything these days to subvert a few of these thriller tropes. Like, I love thrillers, but there's some of their tropes that I just don't like, and the love interest always being a bad guy is one of them. So those are the characters. There really aren't that many that really matter. The main character has a sister who we kind of have a little bit of, of conversation with, but overall, the sister not that important to the plot. She's just there to build up the main character a little bit. So she's got a little backstory. Could really do interesting things with the sister and her levels of guilt because her younger sister got kidnapped and not her, but we're not here for that. That is interpersonal family drama not to be found in a book like this. One of the themes, which is, let's just talk about themes, one of the themes that I really liked being explored in this book, as we mentioned, we have a, a female character who is like sexualized against her will and ha forced to use that, but reads very asexual. And there are a lot of themes in this book of womanhood and the unfairness of expectations of women and how no matter what you do, people are gonna put you in a box. And as a woman, these are the boxes that you can be put in and you don't have a choice. If you're unemotional, you're labeled as a cold bitch. If you're too emotional, you're labeled as hysterical. There's no way you can be as a woman that is correct. And both of the main characters as women in this story face that in different ways at different levels. And I liked that exploration. However, there are elements of it that I didn't like when it came to a third character, which I will now mention, because I, I don't know why I'm going in this order, because technically she is a character who kind of gets a point of view, and that is the ghost, because the ghost is real. And I guess I was saving it for this moment where we talk about the, the haunting because I didn't like what was done with the haunting. One bit at all. So the first time we go to the house, the, the creepy house, to have an interview with the lady, we immediately get a haunting and it's very, very like blatant. The water, the taps keep turning on, the cupboards open by themselves. Just 
that there's obviously that feeling of cold and dread that always comes with ghosts. And the main character like leaves sort of mid interview and like never plans to go back. And I was like, okay, that was very abrupt, but sure, I guess I get it. The house is creepy. But like the, it becomes very obvious very quickly that the ghost is real. And I personally don't like that. In a book like this, I like to wonder for a lot longer if the ghost is actually real or if it's some kind of human trickery. But this book did not leave you any of that. It was like, no, the ghost is 100% real. And the unfortunate thing about the ghost is that the ghost was mostly used as a plot device. The ghost is a device to give us flashbacks. And at the end of the book, the ghost just like grabs the main character and imparts an entire lengthy flashback into her head so that she now knows the whole plot, the whole backstory, everything. It was very deus ex machina. It was very makes it easy for the main character. Like it was almost pointless for her to have to talk to to the accused murderer because the ghost could have just given her everything. If she just sat still long enough, the ghost could have just been like, boop, now you know everything, congratulations. But it waited until the end of the book. But the ghost, it turns out, is the half-sister of the one who was accused of murder. And when they were children, um, the half-sister was abandoned by their mother because their mother got pregnant with her when she was a teenager and she went to like a crisis center where they adopted out. And that's one thing I don't like about this book. It's because once again we have a very negative portrayal of the foster system. And I understand that the foster system can be incredibly difficult and traumatizing for children. But you never see a single good portrayal of the foster system in any book, or at least I haven't. Please show me a book where it's portrayed as not like the worst thing that can happen to a child. But because the, the teenage mother made what I feel is a responsible choice to adopt out her daughter, if she didn't want to have an abortion, she, had, she made the other choice of a teenager to not keep the baby. We are supposed to be like mad at her for making that choice because her her daughter ended up with an attachment disorder, or at least that seems like it was very clearly leaning towards. She's never like formally diagnosed within the book, but it definitely feels like an attachment disorder that makes her very antisocial and eventually murderous. It definitely seems like the book is saying, don't give your child up for adoption. You have to keep the baby even if you're a teenager because otherwise the child will be psychologically damaged beyond repair. Like that's what that's what happens. The the girl comes back, comes back into their lives and uh, the mother tries to welcome her and be a mother again now, now that she's an adult, now that she's ready to be a mother, but it's too late. This girl is too psychologically damaged by being in the foster system. And so she eventually kills the dad who conveniently is an asshole. Like I would have liked it better if he was not an asshole and she still killed him, but conveniently he's a big old jerk face and so she kills him and she kills some other people obviously. And then the younger sister uh, takes the fall for her and then eventually murders her so that there's a ghost now. I don't know why the ghost of the father doesn't stick around, just the ghost of the murderer girl because they were both killed in the house, but okay. Oh, one ghost per house, apparently. A supernatural element is fine. Uh, I wish this book would have been a little bit more blatant about the fact that there that there is one. Like, it, it does have that line where it's like, ooh, things are happening, but is it real? But the is it real does not last long at all. It is immediately very obvious that it is real. And the thing that bothered me is that the main character immediately believed it and was like, oh, I guess there's a ghost. We're haunted. She doesn't, she questions it like this much, this tiny little bit. She doesn't sit and try to figure out how the mur the accused murderer woman, why, why, don't I, why don't I ever remember anybody's names? Shay doesn't wonder if Beth is doing some kind of trickery in this big giant spooky house that she's lived in her entire life or whether there's a ghost, there just is a ghost and Shay believes it almost immediately. And it would be fine if Shay was set up to be kind of a spiritual person who believed in that sort of thing, but she's not. We don't know if she's skeptical or spiritual, she just, is. She doesn't go to church or anything. She's not religious. So I guess we're just meant to believe that she's the sort of person that just believes in ghosts. Alternately, this is a world where ghosts are just real and everyone accepts that they're real. 
could also be a possibility, I guess. I did notice, looking at Goodreads, that this is the author of The Sundown Motel, which I have also read and did not like, and I think I had a problem with that one for the same reason, that the characters accepted that they were being haunted really quickly without any basis for why they would accept that so quickly. All I wanted was a few more skeptical character reactions, and that would have been that would have been good for me if she would have been like, hmm, how could she have done it? How could she have turned the water back on? And then the thing that I want to talk about with the house and Beth having lived there for her entire life and refusing to leave, the, the main character kept asking, like, why won't she leave? Why won't she leave? And we, the reader, are like, yeah, why, why doesn't she leave? Like, what's going on? And I thought that it was going to eventually imply that she had to stay there to keep her sister's ghost, like, grounded there, or her sister's ghost would have gone and done something else. But it doesn't seem that way. Eventually we learn that she couldn't leave because her sister's ghost kept drawing her back, which is fine, I guess, as a reason, but why couldn't she just say that immediately? Once we had established that the ghost was a ghost, why couldn't she just say, yeah, I can't leave because my sister's ghost won't let me leave? She waits until, like, the very last moment of the book to be like, oh yeah, that's why I stayed here, when the main character's always asking that question. So like, couldn't we have had something a little bit deeper or darker, and also something that would have made that character a little bit more three-dimensional? We could be like, yeah, she's kind of a dick, because she is, she's an asshole, but at the same time, she's doing this thing, she's making this sacrifice of herself to stay in this house where she's constantly haunted, to save the rest of the world from her sister haunting them because her sister is a murderous ghost. I get that we can't always get what we want and my version isn't necessarily better than what the author had, but what the author had felt so anticlimactic. Just like after all this time of wondering why she doesn't leave, oh she can't. Okay. And then it turned out all the ghost wanted to do was like boop her story into somebody's head and then the then Beth was able to leave her house for like long swaths of time. And then the ghost just like faded away at the end. There were elements of this book that I liked and I liked some of the themes, but there are definitely things that made this book a negative for me. I ultimately gave it two stars. Better than a one, not so infuriating as a one. But also there were enough things that made me frustrated to not give it higher than a two. But what do you think? Have you read the Book of Cold Cases or any of this author's other works? She does seem to write like a lot of these supernatural thrillers, so if I had recognized it was her, I might have been more prepared for the ghost to just be real the whole time. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna read more of her work though. I don't, I don't love it. Her prose were okay. Like, it wasn't amazing, but it wasn't terrible. It was just like right in the middle, like just kind of prose that you can kind of forget about for the most part. I do think there were a few like, authorial tics that I didn't love, but I don't remember what they are, so they must not have affected my reading experience that much. Thank you so much for watching today, and I will see you again next time with whatever it is I happen to be doing next time. Bye!